Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's Mr. Franklin. We are on part three of three for empiricism. And I'm sure you're glad for that, but we've got one more problem to deal with before we move on to the next theory of knowledge. And that's the problem of induction. The second major problem for empiricism stems from the fact that our experience of the world can confirm or disprove only particular facts, not general or universal claims. If we want to know, for example, whether a particular sunflower is yellow, we can simply look at that particular sunflower. However, if we want to know whether all sunflowers are yellow, we cannot directly determine that by looking at a couple of sunflowers. The empiricist needs a procedure to move from knowledge of a particular set of objects to knowledge of universal and general relationships. Such a procedure is called induction, and this should sound familiar to you from our unit on logic because it's from our discussion of enumerative inductive arguments. The difficulty for the empiricist is to explain how and why we can know on the basis of experience alone that enumerative inductive arguments or inferences as they're sometimes referred to as, how those things are justified. At first glance, you might wonder whether empiricists can simply give up on induction altogether and resign themselves to knowing only particular facts but not universal claims. The difficulty with this solution is that empiricism is supposed to underlie and explain the success of the empirical sciences which rely on general laws like Newton's three laws of motion. These laws of nature are, of course, good examples of universal claims that go beyond the limit of particular facts. If empiricism is supposed to explain how scientists can know that nature is governed by general laws or principles, empiricists need to explain how inductive inferences can expand our knowledge. Let's consider a relatively straightforward example. Suppose that Oliver is a biologist who has spent a good deal of his time observing the habits of loggerhead turtles. He observed, for instance, that loggerhead turtles come to the same beach to lay their eggs every two years. After observing this again and again at different beaches and with a large sample of loggerhead turtles, and after finding out that other biologists had made the same observations about loggerhead turtles, Oliver inferred that loggerhead turtles lay eggs every two years. The enumerative inductive argument in defense of this claim looks like this. All loggerhead turtles have been observed in the past to have laid eggs every two years. Therefore, all loggerhead turtles lay eggs every two years. This enumerative inductive argument poses an epistemic problem for the empiricist. The conclusion of the argument involves not only a judgment about what observed loggerhead turtles have done in the past, but also a prediction about what they will do in the future. Because no one has yet observed what loggerhead turtles will do in the future, an empiricist faces an epistemic problem. What reason do we have to think that unobserved loggerhead turtles will act in the future in the same way as observed loggerhead turtles have acted in the past? It's certainly logically possible that loggerhead turtles will certainly change their egg-laying habits. By the way, we have to uh, pull this argument under the same criteria that we would any other enumerative inductive argument. What's our justification? Well, when real life scientists are confronted with this problem, they frequently point to the principle of the uniformity of nature. 
which claims that the course of nature isn't freaky deaky, that stuff is just going to change. Nature is the type of thing that laws that govern the past will also govern the future. So if we accept this principle, we can create a little stronger argument here about the turtles. All loggerhead turtles have been observed in the past to have laid eggs every two years. Nature is uniform, that is, regularities that have occurred in the past will also occur in the future. Therefore, all loggerhead turtles, past and future, lay eggs every two years. This argument provides a stronger justification than the earlier version, and it's actually deductively valid now. However, we are facing a new challenge. We have to provide reasons to defend that second premise. Remember, the premise that's missing is usually the one that's suspect. So on what basis do we know that the principle of the uniformity of nature is true? Full-blown empiricists think that their experience must provide the reason that the principle of the uniformity of nature is true. So they'll probably use the following argument. In the past, we have seen that many observed regularities have continued to hold. Therefore, all observed regularities will continue to hold in the future. For example, nature is uniform. The problems with this argument um, should be somewhat clear. The argument itself is an inductive inference, which we can justify if the principle of the uniformity of nature is true. But in order for that principle to know that that is true, we need to assume that a specific inductive inference works. So we're kind of going in circles here. In order to show that inductive arguments are reliable, we have to appeal to the principle of the uniformity of nature. And in order to appeal to the principle of the uniformity of nature, we've got to presuppose that inductive arguments are in fact reliable. So this is a, a tautology, or what philosophers like to call begging the question. We end up having to presuppose the very thing that we're trying to prove uh, or establish. This may not be a, a, a fatality for empiricism, but it shows again that committed empiricists have a lot of philosophical work to do before they can claim that scientific laws can be known solely on the basis of experience. A potentially elegant solution to the problem of induction is to claim that we can know the uniformity of nature not on the basis of experience, but using something else. What might we use, dear friend Descartes? Ah, yes. Reason. This would show that in addition to experience, human knowledge needs a second leg to stand on, which is reason. Philosophers who claim that our knowledge depends predominantly on reason rather than experience are called rationalists. We'll look at rationalism next.